God's message to us on many a uh, occasion. He has done so powerfully and presented with clarity the gospel truth. And though, though many things may diminish with age, he's only gotten better. So uh, he still is able to present the truth and a, uh, 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 with clarity and power that even the simplest minds of which I am well aware <laughs> what that is uh, can understand it just as well. So we certainly appreciate his dedication to the cause of Christ and his ability to proclaim uh, the word of God uh, to us in a way that we can understand it and then at that point in time is our responsibility. He is going to speak to us uh, this hour on the church's concern for her members. So come speak to us. Thank you, Brother, brother Cone. Appreciate the kind words. I love and appreciate these godly elders here. And Brother Cone, Brother Brown, Brother West, and their faithful wives and the godly deacons and the godly members, faithful members of this congregation. And I'm thankful to the Lord that I was invited to come and have been able to be here and to participate. And for these other fine brethren here in the lectureship, uh, we learn from one another. I certainly have learned from them, and I do appreciate it. As I was coming up the steps, Brother Cone said he was going to follow me, and I said, well, I, I need to follow you and your example. And so we need to be that kind of example to one another in the Lord uh, as we come together in all these ways. <clears throat> and uh, one thing that I was going to bring out today, I'll just go ahead and do it now at the first, is what the Bible says, given to hospitality, Romans 12, verse 13. One of the qualifications of elders is given to hospitality, 1 Timothy 3 and verse number 2, and 1 Peter 4, verses 8 and 9, and above all things have fervent charity or love among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another, without grudging. So I appreciate the faithful men and their hospitality here, but especially I want to emphasize the women and the hard work they put out in providing the food and other things and their Christian hospitality. And Brother and Sister Brown have been, as always, most gracious. And Sister Brown just works all the time. And she might not want me to bring that out, but I do appreciate both, love and appreciate them both very much in the Lord, and I'm thankful for them and for all the faithful here in this uh, congregation. I don't want to be like a man one time, or in, and I don't feel like I've been treated this way, but he was not a Christian, but his son was a very faithful member to this day, and he said these people kept popping in in the morning. They would come in in the morning to see the man, and he would give them breakfast. Well, they started making a habit out of it. So what he did one morning is he took the dishes and called his dog over and let the dog lick the plates, and he put the plates back up in the cabinet. He said they never came over again like that. So I, I guess they thought they might be eating on one of those Dog licked plates if they did come. <laughs> well, I know y'all don't do that, Brother Brown. So, but anyway, I want to appreciate them and all of you for your encouragement and hospitality. Uh, another scripture that comes to my mind is Hebrews 12, verse 12 to 14 when it comes to the church's concern one for another. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees 
some of us can really relate to that physically, although this has a spiritual connotation. And make straight paths for your feet. If that involves our example. We should make such path or example that we can be easily followed in the right direction. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. And I believe that's one passage that needs to be taught and preached more right there. That's a great passage regarding fellow travelers to the promised land and how we help one another in Christ. But I do want to express thanksgiving to the Lord and to the congregation here for this privilege. As Paul said, and thanks to God and everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 25, Paul said that we are to have the same care one for another. Well, he was teaching the church at Corinth that, but of course it applies to us today in the Lord's church. And may look at that passage a bit more later. But one thing that these lectureships do for me, in addition to encouragement and learning and edification and the good fellowship, is that it challenges us to study more and to learn things that even we have been preaching for many years, at least on my part, I can say, I learn new things. And the word care here is from merimnao, merimnao in the Greek. It means take no thought. The Lord warned against taking thought about things, being anxious and worrying, there in Matthew 6, verse 25, 31, 34. And in verse 33, instead of being overly concerned and worrying about your necessities, he said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And in the next verse he said, take no thought for the mara, for the mara, shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So that admonishing us not to worry and not to be overly anxious. In Philippians 4 verse 6 we find this word. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. Be careful for nothing. And you look around you and say, well, a lot of people are following that. They're not careful about anything. They're very careless in the life they live. But that's not what Paul means here. He means that we are not to worry or to take thought or to be anxious, but to take it before the throne of God. In the next verse, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And when we do that, we turn worry into peace. Instead of worrying, we have the peace of God when we take it to God and trust Him and put Him first in everything. But what is interesting is this same word in which we're warned not to be careful or to worry, be overly anxious, is used in a positive way in 1 Corinthians 12, 25. We're to have the same care one for another. Now that, in my understanding, is a powerful statement. That's a powerful statement. We have an example of a brother in the book of Philippians who was nigh unto death. But rather than worrying about himself, he was concerned about his brethren worrying about him. In Philippians 2, verse 25 and 26, Paul said, Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. Now we know in the family 
uh, when we truly love our family and also our fellow Christians and something is going wrong in our life, sickness or whatever it may be, and we're concerned about our family and our brothers and sisters in the Lord being upset over us like this brother was. That, that shows true love, doesn't it? That's concern. We don't want people that we love and in the Lord to be overly concerned about us. That's the way this good brother in Christ, Epaphroditus, was and certainly the way that we should be. Now, the church's concern for her members involves true love, and that's agape love. That's the noun. The verb form is agapao. It means to seek the highest good of. It is genuine concern for another or others, and it expresses itself in action because this is the kind of love that Jesus Christ had and that the Father had in sending His only begotten Son, John 3, verse 16. And the Lord admonishes us to have the kind of love that He had toward one another. Now, is there any deeper love that we could have or anything that could equal that? That the love that God has and that the Son has and does have? Peter expresses this in 1 Peter 1, 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Brother Guy in Wood says, regarding the word fervently, it is from ektonos in the Greek. It means intensely. And he said it describes an emotion that is vivid and forceful, earnest and pointed. It's that fervent charity that Peter enjoined upon us that we read a while ago, inspired of God, in 1 Peter 4 and verse number 8. We are to love one another with a pure heart, fervently, unfeigned love of the brethren. That means sincere and not hypocritical. Romans 12 and 9, let love be without dissimulation, that is hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. And Ephesians 6 and verse 24, this is a great statement ending the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 6, 24, grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity, it is a genuine, unfeigned, true love that we have for the Lord when we keep His commandments. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Peter here in 1 Peter 1, 22, seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit. The Spirit, sword, is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. And when we obey the Word of God, the truth, our souls are purified. When we obey the gospel of Christ upon hearing, believing, repentance, confession of Christ, and baptism, our sins are washed away, as Ananias said to Saul of Tarsus, and now why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We must go into the water to obey God's command, as did the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, 38 and 39, and come up out of the water. But it is the blood of Christ that washes sins away in baptism because John or speaks of Jesus Christ as him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, Revelation 1 and verse number 5. In Hebrews 9, verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge, that is, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? That is what the blood of Christ does. It purges when we obey the truth. Jesus prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Peter said that uh, we are to love one another with a pure heart fervently, that is, a pure heart that Jesus described in the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> in the Mount, in John, Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
So in order to have a pure love, we have to strive to have a pure heart through God's Word. As Jesus said in John 15 and verse number 3, Now you are clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. Now the nature of the love and the concern that we are to have is found in John 13, verse 34 and 35, where the Lord said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. This has been called the badge of discipleship in that it indicates that we belong to Christ. If we love one another as Christ loved his disciples and even loves us today. We know that the Bible says in John 13, the beginning, verse 1, the end of the verse, that he loved them unto the end. He loved the disciples unto the end, unto the uttermost. He loved them to the point that he would die for them. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, John 15, 13. But we know it also the nature of this love is to love the object even though that person is disappointing or may be unworthy, at least from our point of view, but from God's point of view, that person still is worthy of our love. That's the way that Jesus loved. That's the way that God loved. It initiated him sending his son into the world for the unworthy human race. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. There's that love to the uttermost. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, Romans 5 and verse 6. And we did not deserve what God has done for us and what Jesus Christ has done. We do not deserve that, but that's the kind of love that Christ had and has, and aren't we thankful for that, that he would love unto the uttermost. We know, my friends, in the church's concern for the loss, this involves every one of us. And I'd like to go again to the book of John at this time. In John 15, verses 9 and 10, again, we get an insight to the nature of this love. Jesus said, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. So what is the nature of this love? It is sacrificial. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, Paul said, Galatians 2.20. It is willing to give up something for others. As God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, Romans 8 and verse number 32. It is a sacrificial love, an obedient love, Philippians 2, 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, that's Jesus Christ, in Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So Christ was obedient even to the point of death, even death on the cross, a most excruciating and humiliating death indeed. It is a love that is willing to sacrifice and to suffer and that is obedient in nature as Jesus obeyed the Father. He said, as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, there in John 15, 10. We remember in John 8, 29 that he said, I do always those things that please him. Christ always obeyed the Father. We remember in the Garden of Gethsemane on the eve of his crucifixion that he prayed, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. That describes what it means to be a faithful child of God. 
Thy will, not mine, be done. And that's not always easy to do because we like to have our own way. But to follow Christ, Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9 and verse number 23. But now I'd like to look at the elders and leaders and the members. The elders are shepherds, defend and lead and feed the flock. They shepherd and tend the flock of God as 1 Peter 5 verses 1 to 3 enjoins upon them. And in Acts 20 verse 28, Paul said to the Ephesian elders, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So the elders oversee the flock of God. They tend the flock. They protect and lead the flock, and they feed the flock. Someone might say, well, I, I know what that means. Uh, we, we eat a lot here, and I'm not talking about, I know you do eat, good food here, but I'm talking about some brethren may have the attitude, well, feeding the flock, that means we have a potluck. And and we get to eat a lot. You know, some brethren are fed up, so to speak. So, but that's not really what Paul is talking about. Feed the flock of God. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In Matthew 4 and verse number 4. We know that an elder is to be apt to teach, 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, willing, ready, and able. But yet some, I'm afraid, are apt not to teach. They don't really do that. And again, I'm not describing any, any elder here by saying that, but some are like that. And some want the preacher to do all the warning and perhaps preaching and to take all the hits rather than coming down on the eldership. I know I preached in a place one time, and I began to deal with some things in the congregation. It wasn't popular, and I started getting some criticism in the congregation. And I thought, I wish that one of those elders or all those elders had gotten up after I preached a sermon, especially a sermon warning the brethren about things and it stood up and said we stand behind what he's preaching and teaching that would cut out a lot of that murmuring and criticism if elders would do that but many times they do not do that they do not do that and again I do not believe I'm describing faithful elders like the ones here or other godly elderships but there are many many elders that are not like that they're willing to let the preacher or whoever is preaching or teaching take all the attacks rather than stand behind him. You know, uh, several years ago in Virginia, I was visiting a congregation during a gospel meeting, and not far down the road, there was a large university. And uh, the crossroads movement was in the congregation there. I tried to warn the preacher there. He was older than me. I said, you got crossroads in this congregation. He didn't really appreciate that very much. He didn't heed to it. But later on, sometime later, crossroadism split that congregation. They did have it. And I saw all the signals of it. But anyway, one night in this other congregation, one of those young men from that area where they did have the crossroads movement came in to visit the gospel meeting. And this was right before service started. I remember I was in the hallway, and there was one of those elders there, and he was talking to that young man. And he was telling him how it is. You can visit here, but you are not going to promote crossroadism. We're not going to allow that. And he was telling him that, and I thought, that's what an elder or elders ought to be doing. They need to be warning and protecting the flock of God, which is what that brother in Christ 
was doing. Another example is of a young mother one time who was becoming uh, irregular in her attendance, actually becoming unfaithful. And one day, one of the elders went out to see her. And she started using her little child as an excuse as to why she did not attend more. And the elder asked her this question. He said, what if God took away your excuse? I believe it was the very next Lord's Day she came forward and was restored. And so elders are about the flock to build up the church, to feed the flock, to warn the brethren and instruct them and to edify them. As I said yesterday that a faithful eldership is a great blessing to the church and we ought to be thankful for that. So I want to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12 and 13. Paul said, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, those are the elders, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now, preachers do have a lot of things to deal with. We know that. But so do faithful elders. If elders are doing their job, they have a lot to deal with. And they are dealing with those things, and they should be loved and appreciated for their work's sake. Elders are called elders, Acts 20, verse 17, Titus 1, 5. Overseers, Acts 20, verse 28. Pastors, plural, Ephesians 4, 11. And bishops, 1 Timothy 3, verse 1 and 2. And we know that preachers are charged before God and the Lord Jesus Christ to preach the word, to be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. But every member has the God given obligation to care for one another in the church. At this time, I'd like to go to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, in verse 12 and 13. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Then, going down later in the passage, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and verse 25 and 26, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. I'll pause there for a moment. James said that we're not to be a respecter of persons. God is not a respecter of persons. Acts 10, 34. And we're not to be a respecter of persons either. We're not just to care for those in the congregation that we may know better or that maybe are more pleasing to us, but we should love one another with the same kind of love. We're to have the same care one for another. And then he goes on to say, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. In Romans 12, verse 15, rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. <clears throat> I'd like to read something that I found in the commentary on 1 Corinthians by Brother J.W. McGarvey. He says regarding this matter of suffering and rejoicing together, Moreover, the parts suffer or rejoice as a whole. Now God intends that the church shall look upon itself as such an organic whole and shall feel this lively concern for each other, for each of those, rather, who lack, feeling that the lack of one is the lack of all. And then he gives a quote by Chrysostom. When a thorn enters the heel, the whole body feels it and is concerned. The back bends, the forepart of the body contracts itself, 
The hands come forward and draw out the thorn. The head stoops. The eyes regard the affected member with intense gaze. And isn't that true? Even a thorn in the heel. The whole body becomes involved. And so in the Lord's church, if one member has a need or suffers, we should give that attention. And in the other ways that Paul mentions here in this passage, the same care one for another. Now one way that we have concern one for another is if a brother or sister falls into sin. Brethren, if any of you be overtaken in the fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted, and bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 1 and 2. One thing that he says here I've thought about many times, consider thyself. You know, when we go to correct someone, we have to be firm in the truth. But remember, in the spirit of meekness, we can fall, any of us. Let him that think of these things, as Paul said, take heed lest he fall. I heard about a man who went out one time to see a person who had become unfaithful. And the man came to the door, and the brother that came to see him was getting out of his car, and he said, what do you come out here for? He said, I come out here to straighten you out. And that man, I think he was trying to pull that brother out of the car. We just don't handle things like that. We have meekness, but yet we are firm in the faith. James said, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall out a multitude of sins. James 5, verse 19 and 20. And one of the most difficult things to do in the church for one another is if someone does err or go astray, whether it be in doctrine or morality or just neglect of their duty unto God, is to go and to tell them this, to warn them. But yet we know that many do not want to do this. It's not pleasant to do. But yet if we love them and care for them, we will do it. The wise man said in Proverbs 27, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know, the Lord wounded a friend. He told Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. And you know, Peter ended up being faithful. Sometimes we have to wound people's feelings to save their souls. Feelings on the day of judgment is not going, are not going to make us acceptable. It is whether or not we have done the will of God or not. I'd like to turn to the Old Testament at this time to the book of Exodus here in our last few minutes together. In Exodus chapter 17, this is a great story. And uh, maybe all of you are familiar with this. Maybe not. But if you're not, become familiar with this story. In Exodus chapter 17, the things written for time are written for our learning, Romans 15, 4. This is in Exodus chapter 17, the story of Moses, Aaron, Hur, and Joshua in the battle with the enemies of the Lord at Rephidim. And uh, we read here in Exodus 17, beginning at verse 11. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed, that is the Amalekites. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek, that is, Joshua and the children of Israel, and his people with the edge of the sword. It's a great story here because Aaron and Hur, while Joshua and the soldiers were down in the valley fighting, 
Aaron and Hur were holding up the hands of Moses at the top of the hill. Now that's what we need to do toward those who are fighting the battles of the Lord, elders, leaders, preachers, and all members who are in a battle for the truth and standing for the right. We need to hold up their hands and encourage them. Don't just say, well, I'm behind you. You know, some brethren are behind you. You look back, they're way behind you. That's not the way we hold up hands. I know the story of Brother Guy in Woods. Uh, Brother Woods had a lot of debates. And there was this lady, I believe she was a shut-in, and he was coming to her area to have a debate. And she wrote him a letter. She said, I cannot be there, but I am praying for you. I am praying for you. Does that do us a lot of good when faithful members of the church are praying for us and they let us know? Isn't that a great encouragement to know that? Friends, there are many ways that we may prove our love and concern. And, of course, we've not exhausted this subject this morning in this short period of time. But certainly we are to pray one for another. James 5, verse 16. We are to be hospitable. Paul said in three places, 1 Thessalonians 5, 25, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, and Hebrews 13, 18, if Paul did the right, and whoever it was who was inspired, pray for us. Benevolence and ministering to the saints. God is not forgetful to forget, he is not unmindful to forget your work and labor of love in doing that. Hebrews 6 and verse number 10. And then before we close, one of the greatest things that we can do for one another is be a godly example, to be an example. You know, we need to stop and think. Something that we may be doing or involved in, it may not necessarily be sinful, but if it leaves a doubt for someone or could cause someone to go in the wrong direction, we need to think about that. We need to pray and to be concerned about it as we are to be an example of the believers in word and conversation, in spirit and faith and charity, 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. We are to be an example. And I'm not just talking about the elders and the preachers, but every member. Every boy and girl, man and woman, who is a member of the church of our Lord, someone is watching us. We are an example and an influence upon someone. Let us not forget what Jesus said in the long ago. Ye are the salt of the earth. Ye are the light of the world. And let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, verse 13, 14, and 16. Thank you. <clears throat>